we're live good morning everyone today is sunday april 23rd 2023 and on behalf of the international commission for human rights and religious freedom i invite all of you for our monthly speaking up series and we do it once a month we invite a distinguished guest who speaks on a topic of importance for human rights and religious freedoms a little bit about international commission for human rights and religious freedom it's a U.S.-based nonprofit focused on upholding human rights and religious freedom through continuous monitoring, policy intervention, and collaboration. We are focused on educational, research, legal, and human rights advocacy and charitable purposes and strive to be an advocate for human rights and religious freedom of marginalized, underrepresented communities across the world. We believe that humankind can no longer afford to be selectively vocal about the rights of only a specific set of people. A humane and just world necessitates fair treatment of all living beings. Our focus is on indigenous rights and freedom, free speech, and their cultural preservation. Some of our initiatives include monitoring violations of the freedoms and sanctity of religious and philosophical minorities across the world, research into and documentation of the culture, history, and challenges faced by such communities, policy recommendations on human rights, religious diversity, and pluralism to international organizations, agencies, national and local governments, collaboration to support cultural and philosophical diversity across the world. And of course, we have Professor Wade Bean and our fellowship since January 1st, 2022 on human rights. This is our logo. And today we are going to have a distinguished speaker who will be speaking on child labor law violations in the US, the way forward. And our speaker is Christina Guzer. LISWS, ACSW, MBA, and you will see her very soon, or you're already seeing her, but this is a picture. A little introduction for Christina. Christina is a licensed independent social worker with supervisory designation. She is a mental health therapist specializing in suicide prevention and healing trauma. Christina has served at the local and national levels on quality improvement and system redesign initiatives and presented on national educational calls. She is a certified anti-oppression informed practitioner in her region and earned a diversity, equity and inclusion in the workplace certificate from University of South Florida's Mooma College of Business. Having interacted with people from all walks of life, Christina has a passion for diverse culture and religions, upholding human rights and religious freedom, and educating others about the benefits of building respectful, collaborative, diverse, and harmonious relationships. She also volunteers her time as Honorary Director of Planning for the ICHRRF. I have to disclose this bit. She has been a professional colleague of mine in the past, working with me side by side in the same mental health team. She has recently published an article on the same subject of child labor law violations. It can be accessed on ICHRRF website and I have given the URL, the address for that. So this is a picture which shows historically how the child labor was exploited in United States, in mines, in other things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Today's topic will cover the history of child exploitation in the US, remedial measures, continuing neglect and loopholes, recent trends showing an increase and recommendations how to combat it. The talk will be followed by question and answers, actually. People might think that US being an advanced society would not encounter child labor, labor at this time. But this boy, a ninth grader, works overnight as, at a sawmill in South Dakota. While he works 14 hours shift, he skips a school. This was recently covered in New York Times. And of course, there's a pending child labor amendment to US Constitution, which was proposed in 1924 and is still pending because only 14 states have ratified it. In order to become part of the Constitution, at least three-fourths of the states have to ratify it. So it is still pending, waiting for ratification by the states. So additional ratification by at least 10 states would be necessary for it to come into force. A few housekeeping rules. Please mute yourself to avoid noise interference. Please change your cell phone to vibration set setting. Please do not interrupt when our speaker is speaking. Those people who want to ask questions can send their questions through the chat room. All questions are moderated. Please ask questions that are very specific. Please don't write lengthy comments in the chat room. We will entertain all the questions at the end of presentation by Christina. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to present Christina Boozer, who is going to be talking on child labor violations in United States, the way forward. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Adit Tianji. And welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today. There's a lot to cover and I hope to leave some room at the end for discussion. Before diving in, I'd like to thank the uh, ICHRRF for having me speak on this today and helping raise awareness of this important issue. So we'll dive right in and get started. Um, child labor is defined as any form of work done by minor children. The picture you see on the left is uh, child laborers in Nigeria, and the picture on the right, as hard as it may be to believe, is from a United States Department of Labor court filing depicting a Pactor Sanitation Services employee at the JBS power plant, uh, beef plant in Grand Island, Nebraska. And this was retrieved from the Department of Labor website. So as you see, it looks pretty young. So I'm not going to um, read over this in great detail. You can take a look at it, and I'll introduce how I got interested in this subject. I started my career working with at-risk youth and their families, and um, including in the community and in the correctional facilities. A lot of the, the youth I worked with were at-risk. They were urban youth, and they reported that opportunities for work were sparse and their communities are not really easily accessible. And um, a lot of the times they said that they were eager to learn new skills. And uh, when talking with their families and caregivers, what was most important for them is that their uh, youth stayed out of trouble and learned meaningful skills and had a better future than that they could ever imagine. The families really wanted their youth to, um, you know, have basic needs met and develop skills and, and stay off the streets. Um, when looking at the cost and benefits here, it's clear that there's much more costs to uh, child labor than there are benefits. Um, the poorest families tended to live paycheck to paycheck and they were in survival mode. Uh, despite this, much of the feedback I heard is that they wanted to break family purses. When asked to expand on what that meant, they really touched on intergenerational poverty, trauma, and limited economic opportunities. 
exacerbated by systemic oppression and possible racism. Some of those other largest concerns were really to break glass ceilings and, um, and really focus on that quality of life there. A review of the literature demonstrated that communities and employers benefit from having an educated workforce. Some of those costs of child labor violations on employers include sanctions and financial fines, staffing shortages, um, primarily due to injuries and uh, reputation loss as well. It, even there is a cost benefit analysis that includes um, an overall higher cost to everybody, to the entire community, uh, to the world at large. The International Labor Organization's program on the elimination of child labor argued that there's uh, many costs uh, to child labor than benefits. Uh, which include uh, the cost of higher education, which is very expensive these days. And uh, that's approximately two thirds of the overall cost. Benefits included eliminating the most dangerous forms of child labor and educating youth, which results in an increasingly educated workforce and improved health and mental health. This is going to support the continued development and well being of individuals, families, and communities and uh, overall support economic gains. IPEC also argued that there's an opportunity cost for families when youth are placed in school instead of working. A uh, proposed solution is uh, offering social and economic assistance to these impoverished families. Ultimately, the IPEC estimated the cost of eliminating child labor to be approximately 760 billion in US dollars However, the long-term social, economic, and health benefits would be closer to 5.1 trillion United States dollars. This is clearly a significant human rights issue and dire need of urgent attention. So first, we're going to review the history of child labor, barriers to improve working conditions, and early efforts to organize. Then we're gonna review some child labor laws, and then we're going to identify both historical and recent violations of child labor laws in the United States to include labor trafficking, exploitation, and sex abuse. And then we're gonna talk about the next steps forward. Child labor has existed through much of human history and peaked during the industrial revolution due to demand for miners and factory workers and an influx of available child immigrants. Immigrant children tended to be vulnerable, which made them easily exploitable, and they were less likely to organize and strike against abhorrent working conditions. In 1900, around 18% of the American workforce was under age 16. Presently, child labor is still prevalent in agriculture, and there's exemptions from certain labor laws. Some youthful agriculture workers are at risk for being labor trafficked. The very first efforts to denounce child labor were led by clergyman Edgar G. Murphy and his supporters in the 1890s who established the Alabama Child Labor Committee. Around the same time, organized efforts to improve social welfare in the North culminated in the development of the New York Child Labor Committee and the 1903 National Conference of Charities and Corrections. Among the activist attendees included fiercely passionate social worker Nobel Peace Prize winner Jane Adams and she challenged the ethics of child labor. When Reverend Murphy learned about these organized efforts, he organized with the New York Child Labor Committee in efforts to build a national organization on child labor reform. Then on the 25th of April in 1904, the National Child Labor Committee was established. The NCLC advocated for child labor reform at the state and federal levels, including advocating for the child labor amendment passed in 1924. This amendment was never ratified. In fact, the child labor amendment is still pending to date. And we have an author Kratz here in 2020 found that the child labor amendment fell short of the required three fourths threshold and ratification by 10 more states is needed to add this amendment to the constitution. 
Efforts to improve workforce conditions were met with heinous resistance, and the Supreme Court is not without fault and does not cover itself with glory. The United States Supreme Court served as a barrier to improving working conditions for both women and children. Congress passed the Keating Owen Act of 1916, which forbade the shipment across state lines of goods made in factories, which employed children under age 14 and children between 14 and 16 who worked more than eight hours a day overnight or more than six days a week. Congress claimed constitutional authority did, due to Article 1, Section 8, giving Congress power to regular, regulate interstate commerce. However, a gentleman by the name of Roland Dagenhart worked in a textile mill with his two teen sons. He believed this law was unconstitutional and therefore sued. He argued the 10th Amendment empowered states to regulate child labor. He argued the law was something that could not be regulated by commerce. And he argued that the Fifth Amendment entitled his children the right to work. The Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Dagenhart and struck down the Keating Owen Act as unconstitutional. Hammer versus Dagenhart um, in the Bill of Rights Institute is where I found that, and that's actually a link that can be clicked on. Congress then enacted a law guaranteeing minimum wage to women and children employed in Washington, D.C. in 1918. The D.C. Children's Hospital sued then wage board that was appointed to set the wage, and uh, they claimed the statute violated the freedom of contract found in the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court voted 5-3 that minimum wage law infringed upon the Fifth Amendment guarantees of life, liberty, and property, and indicated employer and employee had a constitutional right to contract in whatever manner they please. Then Justices William Howard Taft, Howard Wendell Holmes Jr., and Edward T. Sanford offered dissenting opinions, arguing that Congress had the policing power to correct recognizable evils. Fourteen years later, the Supreme Court overturned that position that was adopted by then conservative majority and ruled that some government interventions in contracts between employers and employers is not unconstitutional. Full well understanding the devastating impacts of the Great Depression on working families, President Franklin D. Roosevelt swiftly signed the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 as part of his New Deal. This alleviated unemployment with a public, public works program. Tragically, the Supreme Court ruled that Roosevelt's solution was unconstitutional a mere two years later. Later, President Roosevelt signed the landmark Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 into law. The Fair Labor Standards Act set a framework that continues to evolve and adapt to today's standards of living in the United States. The Fair Labor Standards Act initially established minimum age for employment in non-manufacturing jobs at age 14, outside of school hours with regulated working hours for minors under age 16, and then minors age 16 may work during school hours in interstate commerce, and persons age 18 may work in potentially hazardous occupations. Exceptions for child labor laws included agricultural and entertainment industries, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So some fast facts about the International Labor Organization. The United States became a member state of the UN on October 24, 1945. In 1960, the ILO published a report that demonstrated evidence of failure to protect youthful workers in more than 70 member nations. In 1992, the ILO expanded to include the International Program on the Elimination of Child Labor, which seeks to remove children from hazardous labor conditions and eliminate child labor. More recent updates to the FLSA indicates that in cases where employees are subject to both state and federal minimum wage laws, the employee is entitled to the higher minimum wage. However, youth under age 20 may be paid $4.25 per hour during the first 90 consecutive calendar days of employment. Certain full-time students, student learners, apprentices, and workers with disabilities can be paid less than the minimum wage under special certificates issued by the United States Department of Labor. 
There's very specific job types, hours worked, and age ranges that youth are authorized to work listed in the U.S. Department of Labor Youth Rules for Young Workers, and hopefully I'll be able to pull that up later. Laws remain relaxed in the agricultural and entertainment industry to this date. Unfortunately, these laws and regulations are routinely violated, often exploiting the nation's most vulnerable families and youth, including by way of human and labor trafficking and sexual exploitation. According to the Department of Homeland Security, human trafficking exists to this very day. Human trafficking involves the use of force, fraud, coercion um, to obtain some type of labor or commercial sexual act. Millions are trafficked worldwide, including in the United States, and children are no exception. Traffickers use violence, manipulation, romantic relationships, and false promises of well-paying jobs to lure victims into trafficking situations. They seek out persons of all ages, races, genders, and nationalities who are particular easy targets. They seek out persons who are victims of natural disasters, who have no support system, who are politically unstable, and who are economically, psychologically, or emotionally vulnerable. They use fear tactics and psychological manipulation to maintain control of their victims and exploit language barriers. Unfortunately, many victims of human trafficking may not ask for help for a myriad of reasons or even identify as victims. Another form of exploitation includes forced labor. Forced labor occurs when people are forced against their will to work or provide services. Victims of forced labor may be monitored or restricted and have language barriers, making it difficult to ask for help. Those at risk of forced labor victimization include people with unstable immigration status, language barriers, those who lack support systems, people with disabilities, and folks who are struggling emotionally, psychologically, or economically, um, including folks who have been traumatized and people who lack basic needs like food, water, safety, and shelter. So this uh, Catherine Kafka Waltz in 2017 found barriers in combating child labor trafficking and those barriers are primarily due to a lack of research and data collection on this issue, legislation and policies which prioritize sex trafficking, and the lack of effective training of first responders and child serving organizations, which often result in ineffective operational responses. In other words, there's a lot of room for improvement in early identification and intervention. And in fact, I think it would be helpful for um, folks when they get promoted in a lot of positions where there are youthful workers to be educated on the law. It can be really difficult to accept the fact that exploitation of our nation's most vulnerable citizens exists. The National Institute of Justice found that 71% of forced labor victims entered the United States lawfully with H-2A and H-2B visas. These victims abided faithfully by laws and policies to do what it takes to have a fighting chance at the American uh, dream and really to obtain an improved quality of life. The H-2A visa program helps American farmers fill employment gaps by hiring workers from other countries. There's applications for immediate need, emergency, and standard extensions. The H-2B visa program allows United States agents and employers to bring in foreign nationals to fill non-agricultural jobs. Beer in the Cato Institute of 2020 clarified that while they're violators of the visa programs, the research found that most H-2A employers do not violate laws. And also there's little context about the frequency of H-2A trafficking reporting because many participants fear losing their visas. Um, also, it will be helpful to make the H-2A program less complicated for both employers and employees to both understand and navigate. Uh, workers can benefit from being educated on their rights and it will be helpful for workers to be authorized to leave their jobs without fear of losing their immigration status because workers care about having legal alternatives to illegal immigration. 
Switching gears a little bit here, recently in the media, a woman and her two daughters were indicted on a labor trafficking conspiracy charge for allegedly forcing two undocumented West African teens, ages 12 and 14, to work in Chicago suburbs. They were coached to lie to immigration authorities about family relationships to avoid tourist visas, and they were accompanied to the United States. Once here, the defendants harbored victims in residences. The teens were forced to provide labor and services that benefited the defendants financially. Human rights firm International Rights Advocates named several major companies, including Nestle, Mars, and Hershey, as defendants in a lawsuit filed in Washington, D.C. on behalf of eight former Mali children who alleged that they were forced to work without pay on cocoa plantations. Allegations included unjust enrichment, deliberate inflictions of emotional distress, and negligence. West African cocoa production has previously been linked to human rights abuses, low pay, child labor violations, and structural poverty. While this did not occur on United States soil, some of the accused are U.S.-based companies. Nestle being one, has publicly pledged to end the reliance on child labor despite their legal argument was such that they could freely use enslaved children to harvest cocoa. The Supreme Court issued a divided opinion on this case against Nestle and Cargill under the Alien Tort Statute. In November of 2021, it was revealed that a three-year multi-agency investigation into human trafficking led by Homeland Security, dubbed Operation Blooming Onion, uncovered one of the largest human trafficking and visa fraud rings in our country. The H-2A work visa program was exploited to smuggle foreign nationals from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras into the United States in order to serve as agricultural workers. Activities also took place through the Middle District of Florida and Southern District of Texas. 24 defendants were indicted and faced multiple charges, including but not limited to conspiracy to engage in forced labor, conspiracy to commit money laundering, forced labor, and tampering with a witness. Victims were smuggled migrant farm workers from Mexico and Central America into South Georgia, rural farms where they went largely unnoticed and were detained by electric fencing, in dirty cramp trailers with raw sewage leaks, and with little access to food and safe drinking water. They earned only 20 cents per bucket of harvested onions, sometimes with their bare hands, while under the threat of gun violence. These migrant workers were also subjected to wage theft, which include being charged unlawfully for transportation, food, and housing, and being utilized for lawn care and construction work outside of the agricultural roles they were employed to fill. Their passports were confiscated by their handlers and they were threatened with deportation. Tragically, there were deaths uh, due to these horrendous working conditions. The accused are alleged to have raped, kidnapped, and threatened the lives of not only the workers, but also their families. Worse, workers were also sold or traded to other conspirators. More recently, the Department of Labor sounded the alarm on increases of child labor violations since 2015. Bills were introduced in several states to relax child labor protections likely due to widespread labor shortages and a tight market. Minnesota and Iowa aim to authorize teams to work in construction and meat packing plants. New Jersey passed a law in 2022 that authorized teams to work longer hours and Republican-sponsored bill in Ohio hopes to currently expand working hours for 14 and 15-year-olds during periods when school is in session. Director of Child Issues, Child Labor Issues and Coordinator at the Child Labor Coalition, Reed Mackey, expressed significant concerns about these efforts to relax child labor laws. Uh, he warned of negative educational impacts on youth. And, um, and also in the research, Baylor College of Medicine in 2023 found that child labor tends to occur in poor families and children were at risk of harm when working with dangerous machinery and exposed to harmful chemicals. Uh, in fact, certain child factory workers as young as age six uh, were found to have seven times the safe limit of lead levels in their blood work. 
Unfortunately, lead levels are known to affect neurobehavioral development. In addition to these adverse health outcomes, there was also a correlation between depression and age of first starting work. However, the data was complicated by possible childhood abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Uh, furthermore, the International Labor Office in 2016 findings indicated up to 152 million children were exploited in child labor with 73 million working in hazardous conditions, 48% of youth in the labor force were between ages 5 and 11, and predominantly so in agricultural and domestic services. According to PBS in 2018, more than 200,000 unaccompanied minors have entered the United States primarily from Central America, specifically to flee poverty and violence. Regrettably, many high-risk jobs such as amusement parks, rec staff, agriculture, and construction work have high concentration of these migrant employees. PBS uh, indicated that a 2016 Senate investigation found these youth were vulnerable to labor trafficking as they were indebted to their smugglers. And similarly, one study found a North Carolina operation employing uh, Latina uh, seasonal and migrant youth farmhands. These youth reportedly worked in highly demanding, potentially dangerous, and unsupported conditions. So more recently, as of 2021, the ILO estimates, there are 79 million children working in dangerous conditions. This is an 8.4 million increase in child labor in the last four years and 6.4 million increase in number of children working in hazardous conditions. There's an estimated 3.3 million children in forced labor, uh, and then children are exposed to electronic waste, uh, garbage dumps, heavy lifting, dangerous equipment, and physical, emotional, and verbal abuse. The Wage and Hour Division has found over 2,800 minors employed in violation of the law in fiscal year 2021, and employers were consequently fined over $3 million. This situation has not improved. There was a 37% increase in child labor law violations in 2022. Instances of exploitation of child labor spans the entire continental United States. In Nashville, Tennessee, a 16-year-old boy fell 160 feet to his death while working rooftop construction over 11 stories. He climbed over a barrier at the roof line and attempted to jump onto a power-driven device next to the building. He missed that platform and he fell through a gap between scaffolding and building and plunging 160 feet. Records showed that he worked over eight hours a day and more than 40 hours weekly when he was only 15 years old. Stover and Sons were ordered to pay back wages to 55 workers who did not receive overtime pay. They paid over $122,000 in fines. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania McDonald's franchisee in 2022 paid over $57,000 in fines due to over 100 child labor law violations spanning 13 locations. And Crumble Cookies in Utah in 2022 paid over $58,000 in fines due to 46 child labor law violations across six states, allowing youth age 15 to work outside of uh, normal hours and operating potentially dangerous equipment. And there's more. In June 2022 in Tennessee, Schlotsky's Bakery paid over $17,000 in fines for allowing youth to clean and operate deli meat slicers, uh, work after seven on school nights while also participating in wage theft, uh, having poor timekeeping records, and the failure to maintain proof of age records. Super One Foods in Idaho authorized youth to operate dangerous equipment and youth worked excess hours than legally allowed. They were fined over $154,000 and over $114,000 in overtime wages were recovered. And then there's Ridley's here. Ridley's family markets in Idaho were found to have allowed minors to operate dangerous equipment and a 16-year-old sustained cuts while operating dangerous equipment. And then Fred Meyer in Oregon has been a repeat offender dating back to 2007, allowing minors to operate dangerous equipment. They were fined over $55,000 in the latest investigation. 
And in August 2021, there were concerns that unaccompanied minors were labor trafficking victims because multiple youth had the same sponsor. This remains under investigation today. And closer to home here for, for me, uh, Slim Chickens in Streetsboro, Ohio, was warned back in September in 2021 about their practices. Ultimately, they were found to have incurred 330 violations spanning two Ohio locations in Streetsboro and Avon. Minors were working longer and later than authorized and fines exceeded $15,000. And then March 2023, more recently, WL Plastics paid uh, over $6,000 in civil penalties because a 17-year-old employee suffered a minor injury and other youth under age 18 were found to be operating heavy hazardous equipment. They also failed to pay overtime wages to dozens of employees. And most recently broke in the news, February 17, 2023, over 100 children were illegally employed by a United States slaughterhouse. Wisconsin Baked Packers Sanitation Services was found to have employed at least 102 children ages 13 through 17 through eight states and 13 different meat processing plants. This is a clear violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which prohibits minors from working in hazardous employment. Some minor children were found to have sustained work-related injuries, including chemical burns. Youth were found to have worked overnight shifts with hazardous chemicals and to have cleaned various processing equipment. The Department of Labor imposed fines exceeding $15,000 per each child labor violation and PSSI paid $1.5 million in civil fines. The Department of Homeland Security is investigating whether the miners were forced to work by PSSI by labor traffickers with the intent to profit from their labor. Homeland Security is presently offering no comment on this matter as they continue to rule out this possibility with ongoing investigation. So switching gears a little more here, uh, uniquely laws for child labor entertainers vary from state to state and historically have been more relaxed compared to other industries. Uh, David Robb in 2018 reported the Hollywood Child Protection Act is routinely violated and perpetrators remain consequence free. California legislation to protect current and aspiring child actors and performers from sexual predators dates to 2012 and had widespread support, but it lacks firm, fair, and consistent execution. Thus, child sexual predators continue to slip through the cracks. Over the years, various mainstream actors have spoken out about their personal experiences with childhood sexual abuse and the traumatic effect on their overall mental health and functioning. Mainstream actors have spoken out about their experiences being victimized and the subsequent impact on their mental health. Abuse tends to be perpetrated by people in positions of power, influence, and typically authority. So it's usually someone they know. This is traumatic and it can affect the psychosocial development of a child. Corey Feldman has campaigned for reform on the statute of limitation laws and advocated for youth actors. And Natalie Portman here, she reportedly felt afraid and unsafe for having been sexualized as a child. She advocates for youth actors to be able to provide consent and that they need to have agency over their own bodies and the types of roles that they're uh, authorized to play and choose to play. Todd Bridges, different strokes actor, shared his story of recovery after having been molested. And Alex Winter of the Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure shared his journey of recovering from post-traumatic stress disorder after having been sexually abused in Hollywood. And in 2018, Corinthius indicated that Judy Haim, mother of then child actor Corey Haim, named her son's alleged sex abuser and then alleged that the entertainment industry and the media shifts the blame onto the parents. These are just a few of many countless examples of gross negligence and failure to protect in the entertainment industry. This violates both physical and psychological safety of children. So with that said, 
This presentation has demonstrated a widespread problem of child labor law violations within the United States. And human and labor trafficking and child trafficking occurs within the United States and affects our nation's most vulnerable youth up to and including unaccompanied migrant youth. And then employee children in the entertainment industry are also risk, uh, they're at risk of sexual abuse. Children as young as 10 were found to be working in dangerous conditions on farms and very young teens were found in manufacturing industries operating dangerous equipment. And youthful workers were also be found to be working longer and later hours than legally allowed. There's an urgent need for early identification and intervention efforts to identify at-risk youth and warning signs in the workplace to prevent exploitation. This entails required education and programming for managers, supervisors, human resource professionals, and other leaders in the workforce. Youth and their families should be able to feel physically, psychologically, emotionally, and economically safe on their path to self-sufficiency. A comprehensive interdisciplinary and collaborative approach may be helpful. First, key stakeholders can assist in developing and revising workplace policies. And it will be important to have a whistleblower uh, reporting system to safeguard those who disclose violation and uh, naturally ensure consistent consequences for those who violate child labor laws. Secondly, watchdog groups and individual citizens may monitor sponsored bills and changes to local, state, and national laws, and then advocate for measures that allow youthful employees to be protected from child labor trafficking and dangerous working conditions. Next, continued research can be conducted into these matters. Watchdog groups may benefit from collaboration and partnering up on monitoring and reporting of violations, as well as sharing resources on these topics. Communities, families, and individuals can choose to not purchase goods and services that may be at risk of being produced through child labor. And individuals may write to their congresspersons and take a stand against proposed legislation. Additional actionable future steps may include um, adequate resource allocation. Um, I was surprised to learn Ashley Judd in 2023 revealed that the wage and hour division in the Department of Labor does not have enough staff to adequately monitor these egregious conditions, and she advocated in her recent op-ed for improvements. It is critical to ensure that the wage and hour division has adequate staffing to fulfill the needs of monitoring these increased child labor law violations. And at the same time, Sites in 2023 reported the Biden administration announced it is creating a new task force to contend with exploitation of migrant youth in the workforce. Legislative force, um, this is something else that we could do. It is never too late to uh, bring legislative changes. The pending child labor amendment to the United States Constitution needs to be ratified on an urgent basis to give legal cover to the rights of children against exploitation and parental responsibility. Finally, parents of youth entering the workforce may benefit from reading up on guidelines to follow with the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division and individual state laws. The youth preparing to enter the workforce will be undoubtedly benefit from educating themselves on the young worker toolkit and their legal rights as youthful employees. And so with that said, we've got um, some really great links here for folks to familiarize themselves with. And um, mine is opening up. I'll just have to move to the page here. So this is the young worker toolkit. And then there was the parent resource too, but there's um, a Spanish version as well. There's non agriculture. And then there's a whole PowerPoint, public service announcements that you can put on your school's announcement system. If you're an educator, um, even like a way to keep track of work hours for the youth workers and a Spanish version as well. And then the youth employment guide. So, and then more tools for educators and employers. And then you can order all of these toolkits and other publications. Um, being That being said, see if that pulls up for the parents. So 
some really helpful information here from parents um, to read. So for agriculture and non-agriculture. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm about done here. So we can open up for a Q&A with the time that we've got left. Thank you very much indeed, Christina, for a very comprehensive presentation on child labor violations in United States. States. One would think that, would think that in, in United States, it would United be, States, there's some echo coming. You know, you mentioned about Ohio Senate passing a bill to relax the child labor standards. And that has become the trend. More and more Republican states are relaxing the child labor standards. And that's a sad situation. On April 18th, 2023, which is five days in the past, the Senate in Iowa passed a bill by majority support to relax the child labor standards. It still has to go to the legislative house, state house, and be signed by the governor. But you are going to see this trend as the politics become too polarized between Republicans and Democrat control legislatures. And that's a warning sign. There is a low labor shortage and minors are the fodder to get into that system. So that is something we need to consider. Entertainment industry, you rightly mentioned, is one of the major culprits in child abuse and violation of child labor standards. Besides the examples you cited, they are very, very famous icons of Hollywood who have been implicated in child abuse related to actually entertainment work and sometimes using that celebrity status to abuse children. And the famous ones are Roman Polanski and Michael Jackson. The recent, you know, inundation on the southern border, United States border of unaccompanied minor is leading to a new epidemic of child exploitation, trafficking, and violation of labor standards. For these unaccompanied minors who are processed by the ICE and supposedly released into the community to relatives or so-called support system, but they have been whistleblower complaints that unscrupulous businesses are recruiting these for child labor. And in fact, there have been cases when whistleblowers have been terminated from the job. So this is happening as we speak, that unaccompanied minors that are being brought to United States, unfortunately, you do not have any parental responsibility because parents sent them deliberately for better life in United States. The last instance I would mention that was probably not covered, and one would not believe that there is exploitation happening because it happens in the homes of American middle class, day in, day out. And that is the J-1 visa system for au pairs. I mean, supposedly it for cultural exchange. But the au pairs who come here 
for cultural exchange are exploited. They are treated as domestic servants and made to work long hours. And there are several reports with the Department of Labor about this ongoing exploitation. So that area needs to be researched in more depth. Uh, supposedly, they are to be paid $4.25 per hour, but in their wages, sometimes employers add up. Now, they are supposed to provide child care. So in one instance, the family that sponsored them said, we are paying the au pair $42,000. But that $42,000 included cost of a minivan that was loaned to the au pair to transport the children to school. The cost of the gas that was spent on transporting children to school. So fallacious data was used to show the wages. But this is something that is happening in middle class, upper class homes in United States, where these cultural exchange students or OPS come and are treated or mistreated as basically domestic servants. So those are my comments. I am going to start reading through the chat function. And here is a common uh, question from Carl Clemens. The question is, is there any data about whether the shift to nuclear families during industrialization leads to quality of parental, parental care being compromised? I didn't find any direct information on that. I do think that I can probably find it in the empirical literature. Um, there was some read between the lines information that I gathered. I think that this would be uh, something interesting to look more into. Um, and, and then with, uh, you know, just culturally looking at how uh, divorce becomes increasingly common and the need for uh, adapting to a modern family or a single parent household. I do think that there's value in researching more into that. In the same vein, Professor Nidhi Chandurnikar is asking a question and the question you have already touched upon that. Is there any link between American family system values, cultural decline, etc.? to increase cases of child rights violations? Yeah, I think that uh, it's it's not clearly uh, described in the information that I found. It would be interesting to look at more of the empirical data. Um, one thing that I found interesting is that it, there's not any one um, ethnicity, race, or culture that's doing this. It's sort of a hodgepodge of everybody. I think when it comes to places like the fast food industries or the small construction businesses, there just might be a lack of insight, education, and awareness about appropriate law. And that's a missed opportunity where we can really educate people who are responsible for hiring youth uh, the youthful workforce is to make sure that they get educated on the law and it should be standard practice. So workplaces need to improve their policies to be able to do this. Um, with agriculture, there um, there's diverse farmers and diverse needs. And this is something that I really was undereducated about until I started researching more into this about um, what's happening with these uh, co-conspirators working across uh, borders and working with handlers. That was very surprising to me. And to see youth in, in, um, in working in the mechanical industries and in factories with all of this hazardous equipment, to see that uh, that picture in the beginning, that child doesn't even look like he's 13 and yet he's working at PSSI. I just don't understand especially when I've uh, 
met hundreds of individuals in my career that I even help with these kinds of basic needs and they somehow can't seem to get a job. Maybe it's a variety of reasons like need to improve interview or resume writing. I don't know, but to see that there's a young person in these jobs and having chemical burns or exposed to electrical waste and the implications of that or being exposed to lead, these were things that I, I really didn't appreciate before I started researching this. There is a question from Kofi Sarpong. He wants to ask a question. If it is child labor to go to the farm with your friends as young children to go and find cola to sell after school. I mean, the lemonade stand story is that. That's interesting. Um, and I don't know how to answer that. I had myself had a lemonade stand and recently saw some kids outside a couple of weeks ago when we had nice warm weather, their parents were outside with them and they were hustling, <laughs> but they don't typically stay up for very long. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I really don't know how to answer that. That's a good one. And then when I was on my travels in Tennessee, there was, a uh, a wealthy community that had an overlook of uh, a great, beautiful scenery in the mountains. And there was really no parking places for this small park, but it was a tourist attraction. And um, the, the children were offering parking services in their parents' uh, large uh, driveway. And I, I didn't trust it. So I said, can you go get a, an adult? I wanna talk to an adult, is this real? And um, the parent came out, they said, this was all their idea. And she says, I'm allowing it. You can park here, stay as long as you like. And the kids were just, you know, helping me back in and directing me to parking. It was very cute, but they were earning big money. And I think they said that the kids earned over $10,000 in the year before only working just a couple of hours. So um, I think the the biggest concern is where there are formal operations in places that offer taxable wage employment. Um, those are the biggest hiccups. And the places that fall deeply under the radar, remote rural agriculture and the entertainment industries. They have so many laws in California in particular right now, and none of them are being followed and nobody is being held accountable. So those are my concerns. Um, I don't know how concerned I am about the lemonade stand <laughs> just yet. <laughs> Maybe if I find more data. Well, we are coming to the end of the hour. I really thank you for discussing this topic. And I know that you have already published the paper on the same topic. And my hope is that you will continue to advocate for the children. Uh, the trends are ominous because as the labor shortages in this country are becoming very acute, children would be used as cannon fodder to deal with the labor shortages. And we are seeing actually state-wise uh, relaxation in labor standards. Uh, and I think that needs to be considered. And of course, ratification of an amendment that will give constitutional status that needs to be done. And I think people need to be jolted off their sleep or, you know, reminded that this is an important task that has been waiting now for almost, this is 2023. The amendment came initially in 1924. So this is the 99th year. And there does not seem to be any urgency to ratify it. So I thank you and I thank all our participants for being present on a Sunday morning. Not a very good time, but nevertheless, this is an important topic to safeguard the rights of the children. And we shall continue with our advocacy for human rights, children's rights, labor rights, and religious freedom on the platform of ICHRRF. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. We are closing formally. The recording would be available within the next 24 hours. <laughs>